I'm here today with Dr. Maureen Dunn, who is a cognitive scientist, neurodiversity expert, global keynote speaker, board director, and business leader, helping organizations build thriving cultures. A member of the neurodiversity community herself and a Rhodes Scholar, she's the author of The Neurodiversity Edge, The Essential Guide to Embracing Autism, ADHD, Dyslexia, and Other Neurological Differences for Any Organization. So first of all, welcome, Maureen. It's really good to have you here. Thank, thank you, Alison. Yeah, it's, I'm excited to be here. I was really struck, um, I and mean, I read it several times, by a sentence mm -hmm. in your book. I'm just going to read it out, and, and I just want to ask you a bit more about it. You said, this is the moment to embrace authentic neurodiversity inclusion as a core organizational value. It isn't the whole solution to anything, but it is part of the solution to nearly everything which is a cracking sentence, by the way. So first of all, congratulations. <laughs> Nicely put. But just tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that. Sure, yeah. I mean, so I, I think um, obviously um, including all kinds of minds is, has always been really important. Um, but I, we're at this interesting point um, if, in history, I, I believe, where on the one hand, there's increasingly more awareness um, about neurodiversity. And we could explain in a minute um, exactly what that is and, and more details about that. But at the same time, um, we're at this uh, critical point where things have already been you know, changing um, due to technological advancements and AI, and things are about to accelerate um, in a really big way. And I feel that a lot of organizational leaders are not prepared from the human resources side of these massive transformations that are underway. And there's been so much, so many conversations, especially in the last year about generative AI and robotics and what the future might look like. Um, and there's been so much focus on, okay, how, how is an organization, how can we integrate these technological advancements? What can we do, um, you know, to prepare for the technology side of things? But no one seems to be really understanding or talking about um, the human side of this equation and the human resources side and all the range of skill sets that maybe um, in the past have historically been sidelined, um, you know, like nonlinear thinking or systems thinking, um, interdisciplinary thinking, uh, pattern thinking, hyper focus. There's lots of skill sets that inevitably overlap with um, neurodivergent or neurodistinct uh, cognition. And um, I think, and, and then, you know, I would also say that just um, there's a lot of value as well in just including people that um, have different life experiences, that see things from different angles and different perspectives. But particularly in the AI age, um, you know, there should be so much more of a focus in understanding that we're at this point um, in history where a lot more cognitive work is going to be taken over by, by AI and, and machines. And what does that mean for us humans? And, um, and there's been, you know, uh, the unemployment and underemployment rate for neurodivergent people is still um, unacceptably high. And yet, you know, there is documented um, overlap with uh, uncommon skills that would really complement um, neurotypical and, neuro and, and AI um, modes of thinking really particularly well. And so I, I think it's, you know, I brought, I brought that up um, in the book because I think, I don't, I think it's, it's not been something that we've focused on and I think it's um, incredibly important. It, it really made me think how you, the way that you um, calibrate difference in the book as something that is now more valuable than ever before because standard type modes of thinking, if you like, are increasingly turning algorithmic uh, and we, we've got them covered. And actually that, as you say, the non-linear, well, let's, let's lean into that question. When, when you're talking about neurodiversity in the workplace, I mean, we've touched on some of the skills there and the sort of non-linear aspect of it, but, but what are the specific patterns? That, I mean, I'm guessing it's quite a broad church, right? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things um, we all have to be mindful of is, you know, now the word neurodiversity is being being used a lot. But um, 
it's it's a really broad umbrella, right, of uh, different types of cognitive differences. And um, there's in and, you know, some people, you know, include uh, all sorts of, of mental health and other differences, too. So it's, it's a very, very broad umbrella, right? So it's not just autism or ADHD or dyslexia, even. Um, there's, 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 uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really about valuing how, um, the, you know, the different brains work, right. That, that, uh, there's all, there's a richness and complexity to all human minds and we should embrace them all. Um, and, and so what I, when, when I'm, you know, one of the other skill sets, I think that, um, really has been sidelined or hasn't been, uh, fully appreciated in the past is just what I would call these intuitive leaps of creative insight, you know, things that aren't derivative of like linear logical um, patterns of thought, but um, connecting dots between um, very different experiences and, uh, uh, you know, uh, different fields and um, coming up with um, new assumptions and foundations based on um, just connecting these dots that not that aren't normally so you know so, so that's it's also generally a nonlinear process but that's an example of the kind of thing that um, AI you know is outside of this sort of conceptual map if you will with AI. And you talk very much about the organizational benefits of embracing that I mean that really is what the purpose of this book is isn't it it's like you know you this thing that you perhaps might be seeing as a tick box exercise yeah you know inclusion's a nice thing to do but can we afford it you can't afford not to so so tell us a little bit about the organizational imperative yeah I mean and I you know I I think my book uh really tries to emphasize what I would call a values driven approach and rather than um yeah, the tick the box approach of, okay, you know, we, we need, you know, X number of people, you know, they're autistic or have ADHD or, but just, um, you know, seeing, uh, each person for the richness and complexity that all humans are and the, the, the strengths and challenges, and then having a better understanding of these, of the uncommon skills that, um, may be overlooked, particularly in an interview process. So I believe, that there's employed, you know, most employers, there's the standard interview process does not capture um, a lot of the the talent and skills that neurodivergent people have. And so also, you know, I, I bring up a lot of um, strategies for non-traditional interviews and different ways that um, one may be better able to assess talent that could be a huge asset for their organization. I've often thought that interviews measure how good you are at interviews rather than how good you might be at the job. Like yeah. Exams. And that's, and that's one of the problems is right. It's, it's, you know, it, it ends up being many times a, a subjective process and, you know, maybe, maybe a lot of uh, people hiring managers without even realizing it, there is this instinctive bias to gravitate towards people that are like you. Right. And, um, and, you know, do you like this person? And, and it could sometimes be very subjective and not really uh, correlated to what the skills are that are required for that particular role. And so, you know, there's um, a, a lot of, I think there's, you know, it's one of the big reasons why the unemployment, underemployment rate yeah. is, again, uh, you know, unacceptably low. We're looking at, you know, 30 to 40% if we combine uh different neurodivergent typologies it puts me in mind of um matthew syed's rebel ideas where he he talks about the research that shows that when you have people who think in a similar way everybody has a really nice time like the group has a great discussion they really enjoy it everybody feels really positive but they come up with really suboptimal outcomes (laughs) whereas if you have a more diverse group of people the experience of decision making is is harder and more uncomfortable but the outcomes are massively better so right. in a sense, we're asking quite a lot of managers, aren't we? But it's really, really clear what the prize is. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I bring up, I, I, you know, a lot of, of case studies as well in the book um, that I hope will be helpful to employers to just better understand how to do this right. Right. And, and, and also just... Um, you know, examples of case studies where um, there, 
you know, things, things were not uh, going well. <laughs> anti-case studies <laughs> and yeah. and you capture i think two of the really essential qualities of a good business book it's like why does this matter give me give me the theory give me give me the idea but also what can i do about it that has to have that practical element as well doesn't it for sure yep and i do want to talk to you about writing and, and particularly writing as a neurodiverse person and i know that you're going to only speak for yourself um, as we've said it's you know it, it's a very broad church did you notice, do you notice that you write differently to other people? Do you have strategies, tactics that help you tap into the associations or the non-linear aspects of thinking perhaps? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I'm um, I'm not uh, networked in with a, a lot of writers actually, so so I'm not sure how uh, how different my process is, but I, I, I will say that I what I think has been really helpful for me is, um, well, in addition to being hyperlexic and just in general reading a lot. So just, you know, constantly taking in lots of information. So I, I, um, I've always been very interdisciplinary, right. In my, in my interests. Um, so, so I was able to bring in a lot of different, um, topics that are, I think, uh, uh, useful, right. For, for business leaders. Um, but I think the, um, uh, conceptual synesthesia aspect where I can um, sort of, you know, in space around me, um, sort of place different ideas. And, you know, sometimes it's a combination of like words or images and other times it's, 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 it's more abstract than that, but I can kind of then move things around. And so that, that helped me a lot with um, just coming up with like the best structure, right. Which I think is, is you know and 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 the layout of the book and then um you know doing i guess it ended up being a very non-linear process what you're what you're asking me because i would i would write certain chapters and then you know later i maybe would i don't know certain experiences would come to mind or case studies and then i would add them in but i would always i always had like the whole of the book in mind and can kind of move around places, move around um, ideas. I love that spatial and, idea that you're actually almost located within the book. You can move around it. it, it it's sort of there located in, in, the, in your mental space. I mean, you called it synesthesia, but it feels more like a sort of spatial metaphor. Yeah. I mean, it, it, for, for me, that type of synesthesia, is, it's, I'm, I'm what you'd call a projector where I, you know, can, project concepts in space. So like, so, so ideas exist in space and I can sort of, um, you know, even sometimes if there's just an experience or an intuition, it's like, I can pull it out of myself in a way and kind of like, you know, just get more clarity um, uh, about certain ideas and move them around, you know, obviously in my mind, but it's like, it's in space around me. So, so it is a very spatial, um, visual spatial experience. And then, you know, I think too, um, I guess I, I have a very, you know, rich visual spatial memory as well. So like a lot of the stories in the book, um, like the last chapter, especially when I talked about this experience with this mentor, this Oxford Don, that was, a, ended up being a, a mentor to me. Um, just, you know, it was, um, it was really helpful to kind of, um, just replay some of these uh, amazing experiences I've I've had, and and um, you know them being like the visual, you know, detail, and then sort of capturing that in my writing as well. Um, I thought was I, I really enjoyed that process a lot. I do I like I like writing a lot, so that was and fun. that comes across. I think that's interesting. Was there anything that you found frustrating about the process? And we can let's broaden this out the whole process, not um, just the writing, because yeah, that's just the right. first half, right? Absolutely. I um. I sometimes can be a bit of a perfectionist. So it was, it was, it was, um, it was good to work with a big publisher that had some pretty strict deadlines because, you know, I, otherwise I could see myself just, you know, keep adding to it and, you know, wanting, wanting it to, you know, keep, to keep improving it or making sure every detail, like having, you know, it, it, it was a process I felt like it could it could just keep going on and on because I would keep finding some fault with something. Right. And, and, and it so does. It, Many people keep their manuscript in, in the drawer and keep polishing it and polishing it. And it never sees the light yeah, of day. Yeah. So that was hard to kind of like get to a point of, nope, this is uh, <laughs> a ship. <laughs> I mean, 
no more changes, you know, <laughs> this, this is the book. Um, it could always, you're always going to, you know, I think it's probably common. I'm guessing as an author to feel like you could always do something better. Absolutely. But it's got to, you know, let go. Yeah. And it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because while you're writing it, it it's yours. It's just you and the manuscript. It's, it's almost like a, quite an intimate thing. You spend a lot of time together and then suddenly you hand it over and it's, it's not yours anymore. There's, there's other people kind of crawling all over it and, uh, taking charge of it and writing marketing copy about it and and yeah how did that feel have their you know in, own interpretation or bring in their uh you know experiences to what's said right which is you know just part of the process so I guess when you when somebody is reading it and this is the funny thing isn't it because the book has a life of its own now it's its own thing and it's going to make friends out there in the world you know what are you hoping for it well my my hope would be that it, it could make a positive impact um, in the world and actually make a difference in how neurodivergent people are seen, you know, where um, they're, you know, it's, 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 it's not just an interesting read. I mean, I hope people enjoy the book too, of course, but um, that it has an impact, right? That hiring managers will actually want to read it and have more conversations um, about, well, what, well, what can we do better? And that, you know, that will lead to um, decreasing that, you know, uh, that unemployment and underemployment rate in the community that sh- that is uh, unacceptably high. Yeah. And benefit the uh, the organizations as well. And absolutely. It's a and, yeah, it's, yeah, and absolutely. at the same time, right. It's definitely yeah. a win-win. And, and for the, yeah, for the organizations will, uh, I believe, um, will be more competitive and will, you know, have people who think differently. There's a number of studies I bring up, um, particularly about people, the autistic people that um, are, uh, you know, particularly less correlated with the social group and um, may, you know, be a hedge against group think, right? And we know that's like a lot right. of the business and government organizational factors, um, a lot of them in the past have happened because, um, you know, a lot of times in strategy conversations, problem solving and, you know, could end up uh, uh, going in a particular direction because you just have one or two really dominant people in the conversation. And um, it's it's hard to sometimes go against um, a majority view. And yeah. uh, it feels socially people, uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And having people in the room that are used to uh, <laughs> feeling socially uncomfortable. So it's not anything new for them. And, um, you know, there's and may as well just end up noticing things yeah. that other people haven't noticed and um especially you know i think where things are going in the future where um the competitive landscape is is changing fast every day you know i it's it's super important i think and you know to companies to embrace um people that you know have uh, uh yeah especially just different perceptual analytical um, and skills and, but just are coming from, um, things from a very different, uh, worldview or life experience. Yeah. And you make the case brilliantly. And I hadn't made that the connection with, with AI and how that actually just moves the goalposts, changes things and, and makes it even more important. I always ask my guests, Maureen, for, for, um, for their best tip. There will be lots of people listening to this who, uh, maybe neurodiverse, maybe non-linear thinkers. So I'm, I'm, I'm particularly thinking of them, but just, you know, given where you are now, you've come up to the end of your book writing journey and publication. I mean, it's not the end because you still have to, you know, keep on selling thing and, and working with it. But I guess I'm asking, what, what do you wish you'd known at the start? At the start of writing? Yeah, the start of the whole process. What's your best tip for somebody who's just on the journey now at the beginning? just got to keep writing. Like, I think, I think, um, this was my, was my first book. I've published a lot of articles. I had done my doctorate at, at Oxford, but, um, this, you know, I think when you're starting writing, you think like you're just going to go from beginning to end and your first draft is going to be the book or so. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know how other people think of it, but I think, um, I think I understand now that it, it is much more, um, you know, that's where you start. And then, and then there's just this whole other process of revising and polishing and deleting things and, um, and to, um, just, I guess, accept that as part of the process and that's just going to make it a better book. Right. Um, uh, so I think, um, 
I, you know, uh, I think, I think that would, that was, yeah, something that, um, you know, was an interesting, um, and then also I think what was, um, helpful, I guess if I could go back, cause I ended up through the process, just, you know, putting in a lot of things I didn't and think I was going to put in initially, like, you know, I get into, um, you know, Tom, Thomas Nagel, a philosopher, what is it like to be a bat, you know, and, and the server's like, well, what does that have to do? <laughs> yeah. So you have to read the book because I'm, you know, trying to give a sense of proportion about um, neurodiversity, other, otherness, but, you know, things I didn't anticipate I would be bringing in like, you know, anthropology and uh, philosophy to make some of these points for how organizations and business leaders can do things better and be more, more competitive. And I think, um, I think if I could, you know, would go back, I would maybe have spent a little bit more time, um, uh, you know, I don't know, sort of, you know, doing a roadmap that um, included some of those, uh, you know, d- d- just broadening. So I think I started out where it was more narrow and then I just, being so nonlinear myself, I allowed myself the sort of freedom to kind of add in lots of things and then went back and sculpted it. Um, but I think now that I've gone through that process, I probably would start out with like a lot of, um, rather than just, you know, relying on everything in my head, I would probably like, you know, try to look back to like old notes that I had, or, um, you know, maybe, maybe broaden up the scope of things with note cards and, um, that, that might've made it, um, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, faster of a process, I suppose, or at least, or, or, or easier of a process. It's, it's a lovely thought, isn't it? It's almost like you're, I mean, the, the metaphor that's coming to mind is a tapestry and you're sort of drawing in more and more colours and, and different te- textures and, and it's you thought it was going to be quite a straightforward, simple thing, but actually what brings in the, 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 the interest are those slightly uh, left field right, <laughs> examples and that right. interdisciplinary stuff well, and, I get, and you're I, right. And for me too, like I get bored easily, so I'm like, I, I, <laughs> I want it, I want, it needs to be interesting for people to want um you know, even if people are interested in the topic, right? Like a lot, especially a lot of business leaders don't have a lot of time on their hands either. So I think, I think it's helpful if it's in, enjoyable. So I at least tried yeah. to also, you know, make my points in a way that I thought would be interesting and memorable. And that's so important because it, it's very easy for a business book to turn into um, direction and, and just telling and that kind of color, right. I think, saves it. it. As you say, it makes it more interesting, it makes it more memorable, just stops the kind of frictionless passing through of more information to, through your right. brain. Which and, is... I, and I also thought it was important that people could have come to their own conclusions so that I'm not, you know, um, saying this is what you must do, you know, but just, right. but just giving, guiding people down a path where um, they could come to their own conclusions, but um, give them the information to, to get there. Yeah, in fiction they call this showing, not telling. It's a really, really important kind of writer's trait. And I'm going to ask you as well for a recommendation for a book. It doesn't have to be a business book, but what book would you recommend that people who are listening should read if they haven't already? One book um, I really enjoyed that I read a couple of years ago was Think Again by Adam Grant, because I thought I thought it, 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 you know, to me too, it, it kind of fits in with a lot of the um, yeah. points I'm making too, with hiring managers, the way that, you know, as we talked about how interviews are done, or uh, sometimes just initial biases and assumptions that get made um, aren't necessarily the most correct uh, path. So I, I, I enjoyed that book a lot. I would recommend it. Yeah. And he writes so well, doesn't he? It's such a, such a pleasure to read. Yeah. Brilliant. So if people want to find out more about you, more about the Neurodiversity Edge, Maureen, where should they go? Um, they could go to the my uh, book website, which is www.theneurodiversityedge.com, um, or you could go to my personal website as well uh, to find out a little bit more about me, which is just www.maureendunn.com. Amazing. And I'll put those links up on the show notes at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com okay. if you happen to be driving and you haven't got a pen and paper to hand or anything. Mm-hmm. So it's been just really fascinating talking to you. I enjoyed the book and I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much yeah, for, no, um, for for the insights. I, 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 yeah, thanks. thank you so much. This was, this was great. I enjoyed it myself. <laughs>